Roger, let's talk a little bit about this wall over here. So much great stuff. So many pictures of phenomenal cars. How about, let's zoom in here to this lava jet car right here with the flames. Tell us a little bit about your involvement with the Lava Soap Company. Well, it was probably the biggest thing that ever happened in my entire career, Scott. Uh, I had just spent uh, 10 wonderful years with FNF Laboratories in Chicago with the Daily Sea Candies. That was the car. The Daily Sea Jet Dragster was the first car that was ever licensed by NHRA. And uh, then we had the Sherbert's car, the Four Spatial, and the Smith Brothers cough drop cars, and a couple more Daily C cars that we built along the way with that sponsor. And uh, that program was over after 10 wonderful years with a great sponsor, Mr. Fox, who uh, owned FNF Laboratories. And uh, I uh, got a call from Jack Pfeiffer at Leo Burnett Advertising Agency in Chicago uh, asking if I may be interested in talking to them about a sponsorship with Procter & Gamble. At the time, uh, the name of the brand wasn't mentioned. I said, yes, I'm very interested. At the same time, though, I was negotiating a deal, deep in negotiating a deal, with what at that time was a major airline, and that one looked pretty good. It finally reached the point I'm in deep negotiation months later with both companies, and the airline said, we got to have an answer in five days, and I took the risk of waiting for Procter & Gamble. Uh, not only uh, that I was I going to have the sponsor with the biggest advertiser in the world, but one of the greatest companies in the history of business with Procter & Gamble, and it was Lava Soap. And part of the program was I would do television commercials for them. And I did those television commercials, uh, the, the Lava Soap with the Lava Machine, for five years, and I did uh, six uh, public service announcement TV commercials for the National Safety Council. I was their spokesperson of the year for two years in uh, 1986 and 87. Great, great opportunity for me, and it really did give my career a giant boost. Well, it was always great seeing you on those TV commercials. The drag racers would go nuts when you're on TV. Yeah, well, it was the best thing that ever happened to me, and these were uh, not mediocre commercials. They were done with uh, an incredible amount of preparation. We did one of them in New York out at uh, uh, the Republic Airport, and then we did uh, the other commercials at uh, out on the, the Mojave Desert uh, where we ran the car out there to get the action, but we actually filmed those commercials in Hollywood, just like the big guys do, and you know it was a it was a big step for a country boy from the back road where I came from. In fact, here's your lava helmet right here. I'll paint it up, and it's got a few battle scars on it. Every car I drove had a few uh, battle scars on it, and uh, that one did too. I had a. Unbelievable crash in one of the lava machines, and uh, I survived it and was back racing three weeks later. Now let's talk about this one car down here at the bottom with the chutes open. I don't think you're supposed to be doing the wheelie <laughs> when the chutes deploy. Aren't you supposed to do the wheelie at the starting line? Well, I think uh, I got confused along the way. No, we uh, we built this car. Romeo Palomides actually built this car, and it was the most radical car that was ever built for jet car racing. The reason why I've been a real weight fanatic in my whole career to keep uh, these cars as lightweight as possible. We were sitting there ready, getting ready to build a car, and we were having a discussion at midnight one night about how strong that particular jet engine was. It was a J34-48 Westinghouse jet engine. And I made the comment before we left the shop that night, we're going to start on this car the next day. The engine's sitting there in a pile of tubing. I said, you know, Romeo, that engine's so strong, I don't even think we need the chassis around that car and think of all the weight we could save if that happened. Uh, he said, you've been up too, uh, too long, Roger. I came back the next morning and was really pressed with my idea because I thought about it all night. And we came back and we built the front of this car to, to mount to the front of the jet engine. We mounted the rear of the car to the, uh, to the turbine wheel guard. It was a 151-inch wheelbase, however, the rear wheels was too far forward, so when the parachute would open, the very first run I, I made with this car, I probably run, I don't know, it was a short run, probably run 240 or 250, 
and it lifted the front end off the ground like that. And I thought, oh, no, I have a brand-new car, and I've crashed it already. That got your attention. Right? Yeah, it really did. But after that, uh, it didn't bother me one bit. I, I love driving that car. I never put a scratch on it for the years that I ran it. And would it do that every time you ran the car? Yes, it did. Matter of fact, you got used to it? Yeah, I got used to it right away. Uh, I uh, I had we have one picture of that car somewhere here in the archives that Norman Blake took. That car is standing up on the left rear wheel at 284 miles an hour, and it wow. sat down. It, it was like landing an airplane. That same deal. Uh, it would lift it way high in the air, and then the front wheels would come down and bounce, and the smoke would pour off of them, and uh, just like it would in an airplane. And I just rode it out and stopped the car. 